In July of 2022, I uploaded my first art and story time video. And in the summer of 2023, just over one year later, I hit 100,000 subscribers on this channel. Today, I wanna to talk about what that was like, what it's been like for the past year as over time, joining this platform has completely changed the way I go about my career as an independent artist. How, despite its many flaws, YouTube has gone from something I started doing casually for fun to not only being the main way I market myself as an artist, but also as an important pillar of my income. I've had a few conversations with other artists recently, talking about marketing and how to get your work out there to try and make a career as an artist online. And over the past year, YouTube has come up in just about every single one of those conversations. I told so many of my artist friends and mutuals, starting a YouTube channel has been one of the best things I've ever done for my career. And it's true. Despite how hyperbolic it sounds, I'm being genuine when I say it. YouTube has, in many ways, completely changed my life and how I go about marketing myself as an artist. And I want to talk about that. This video is going to be a little different from my usual story time videos. It's less of a single narrative and more of an introspective exploration of what doing this job is like and how YouTube itself helped along the way. We're getting a little experimental here, so I hope you all will indulge me as I get some of these thoughts out in the open. And if you're also an artist trying to see if starting a channel is a good choice for you, well, I hope this video will help offer you some insight. But before we get into it really quick, let's do Hey Star, what you drawing? The art in the background is the art I did for my webcomic Castoffs November Mail Club set. The theme for this month, chosen by my Patreon supporters, was a cozy autumn theme, and I had a lot of fun doing the art for it. You can get this month's art by joining my Patreon during the month of November, and if you want to learn more about the characters, you can check out my webcomic Castoff for free at castoff-comic.com. Links to both of those are in the description. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about YouTube. Technically, I've been on YouTube for a while. Back when the website was first getting off the ground in the mid-2000s, I was in middle school, posting anime music videos and sketchy animatics on my very first channel. Most, if not all, of those videos have been removed in the years since, either from copyright takedowns or me privating them out of embarrassment. After that, I stopped making videos for nearly a decade until I eventually took up streaming as a hobby and made this channel so I could post archives of my Twitch streams and the occasional speed paint. So while I usually say I started doing YouTube last year, I've technically been on the platform in one way or another for about half my life at this point. However, up until last year, I never saw YouTube as a career path for me. I didn't want to become a YouTuber. My goal was and always has been making a career with my art, supporting myself with my comics, illustrations, and other creative endeavors. I've been an artist on the internet for roughly half my life at this point, and over the years I've used just about every platform I could manage. I started on DeviantArt in 2007 or so, then branched out to Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, basically all the major social media platforms one could post their art on. When I first started, I mostly just wanted to post the stuff I drew to show other people, the modern day version of passing my sketchbook around to my friends like I did when I was still in school. But over time, and especially once I started thinking about making art my full-time job, my priority shifted into growing my audience so I could effectively market my work. and. Here's the thing, I love art, I love drawing, I love being able to get up in the mornings and sit on my couch in my pajamas with a cat snuggled up next to me and draw comic pages and call that my work. But here's the thing, the art is the fun part. And in this profession, doing the art, actually drawing, is only about 20% of the job. The rest is a ton of behind the scenes stuff I call my admin work maintaining my online shop, packing and shipping out orders, doing customer service, answering emails, so many emails, planning and attending conventions, running my Patreon, and arguably the most important part, marketing. Getting people to know that I exist and trying to get them interested in the stuff that I'm making. And that part, that part's hard. Out of everything else in my career as a freelancer, marketing is probably the part that I and many others struggle with most because it's so different from just being able to draw a nice picture or write a good story. Marketing is an entirely different skill set that has to be developed on top of everything else. I know so many fantastic artists who struggle to get seen online just because they don't have a good sense for marketing themselves or they just aren't interested in that type of thing, which is completely valid and I do not blame them for feeling that way. Heck, I'm the type that finds marketing interesting, but even I wish I didn't have to bother with it sometimes. 
There's a psychological experiment called a Skinner box, where an animal like a rat or pigeon is put in a box and given a button. And every time it presses the button, it gets food. The result they get is consistent and directly equivalent to the work they put in. One button press equals one piece of food. But in a variation on the experiment, the button would start to give out food randomly. The animal would press the button, and sometimes it would get just a little food, sometimes it would get a lot, and sometimes it wouldn't get any food at all. And once the element of randomness gets introduced, it starts to drive the animal crazy. Pressing the button over and over and over again, expecting and hoping for the food, but only getting it a small percentage of the time. And unfortunately, that's a bit of what social media and internet marketing is like. Sometimes you spend hours on an art piece and it flops completely. Sometimes you put together a dumb TikTok in two minutes and it gets over a million views in a day. And sometimes, no matter how much you try to do everything right, you get the exact same results for weeks on end. And that last scenario is always the one that's been the most frustrating for me. The feeling of having plateaued, the feeling that you've been stuck at the same level, grasping for the same straws for days, weeks, months, even years. That frustration can lead to either giving up or spending even more time pouring yourself into making good content for an unfeeling social media algorithm, only to not get the results you want or expect. A lot of times, heck, I'd argue most times, the work you put into social media marketing isn't equivalent to the results you get out of it. And that's something I think every creator can relate to, including myself. I started my webcomic cast off in 2015, a few years after graduating from art school with an animation degree. After failing to get a studio job, I found work doing art for a corporate entity for a few years before moving to Japan to do a brief stint as an English teacher. And while I was there, I started thinking about what I wanted to do when I returned to the States. Would I try to get a studio job again? Go back to doing boring, soulless work for a huge company? Or was there a chance I could try to make it on my own? Become an independent freelance artist, do conventions, make merch, take commissions, earn some money through the Patreon I had started for my webcomic, and ultimately pay my bills with the art I made myself. In the end, that idea really appealed to me, so during the final year of my teaching contract, I dedicated most of my time to a combination of research and trying to grow my audience online. To that end, I started getting really into social media marketing. I read articles, I watched videos, I tried to soak up every ounce of knowledge I could in order to take it and use it for my benefit. I started an Instagram account just for posting art and made it a point to upload there as often as possible. I did the same with other platforms like Twitter and Tumblr, eventually even paying for a third-party social media scheduler I could use to post art automatically during the most opportune times of the day. When I moved back to the States and started my online store in 2019, I downloaded TikTok after hearing it was a good place to advertise small businesses. I tried to keep track of trends that were making the rounds and coming up with ways I could use them myself to try and fish for a viral post. I'd spend hours going through my For You page, bookmarking popular audios I might be able to use, finding successful small business accounts and seeing what kinds of things they were posting, taking in the knowledge available to me, studying, researching, testing others' methods for myself, experimenting, trying different things, seeing what worked best, and making more videos along those same lines to try and recreate the successes I had achieved. And if that sounds exhausting, yeah, it was. But I wanted to make this work, to make this career work. And in the current day, social media is the most accessible way to go about it. And while it was slow going at first, like all things are, I eventually had my first major strokes of luck. I had a random video go viral on TikTok and suddenly, boom, 50,000 new followers out of nowhere. Push the button, get a piece of food. I then tried to replicate those successes, making other videos along the same lines or about the same topic, posting pieces at similar times with similar hashtag. Average amount of views. Little to no increase in followers. Pushing the button over and over with no reward. I'd keep doing this for weeks, months, trying to grab hold of that success I had seen previously. And while I did very rarely get lucky, a vast majority of the time I got nothing spinning my wheels with no progress to show. And I hear you thinking, Star, you're sitting here complaining about all these problems that social media has, but YouTube has a lot of the same problems. YouTube has the exact same Skinner box problem as every other social media platform, and there's never any guarantee of success, so it makes YouTube so much better for marketing than other platforms. And the answer is actually quite simple. Frustratingly simple, in fact. 
the thing YouTube has that most other platforms don't that makes using it for marketing so much easier? Hyperlinks. I'm not kidding. So if you've spent any meaningful amount of time on platforms like Instagram or TikTok, you've probably heard the phrase link in bio used when people are trying to promote something. Since they can't post a link directly in the description of the post or video, they'll instead use the single provided link in their creator bio to link to whatever it is they're promoting, usually accompanied by saying, if you want to see slash buy this thing, check out the link in my bio, which is a little indirect, but it's easy enough, right? I hate this. I hate Lincoln bio bullshit so much. Whenever I see the phrase Lincoln bio, I want to fly into a murderous rage. Kill Bill sirens playing in the background and everything. I especially hate the fact that as a person who uses these platforms to promote my work, I've also had to do the Lincoln bio bullshit. Every time I have to type the words link in bio in my Instagram or TikTok video descriptions, a small part of me dies. I hate it. I hate it so much. But most social media platforms are so obsessed with getting you to stay on their app. Keep looking at their app. Don't leave our app. Stay here and look at our silly videos and also our ads. Stay here forever, please. That they don't want users promoting any kind of links that will take you away from the app to go look at something else. And the result is that they actively make it harder for people to leave. They don't allow you to post hyperlinks or make it so posts with links aren't seen by as many people, which in turn makes it exponentially harder for anyone trying to promote things with that platform. A thing to note is that in general, people on the internet can be pretty lazy. If what they want to find isn't easy to find, they'll quickly stop caring and go back to something else. I'm guilty of this myself. There are studies in the psychology of internet marketing that say the more clicks it takes for a viewer to get to the thing they want to see, the less likely it is that they will get there. If I see, for example, a product I want to buy in a YouTube video, if there's a hyperlink I can click on to take me directly to where to buy that product, I click once, boom, I'm there. Easy peasy. But what if there is no hyperlink because the platform doesn't allow it in cases like TikTok or Instagram? If they have a link in bio, then I have to click on their username to get to their user bio, click on the bio link, and then get to the product I want. Two clicks minimum. And you may think, oh, well, that's not so bad. But because you're basically doubling the amount of work people have to do to get to the product, you're making it so exponentially fewer people will even bother trying to get to that product page at all. And this gets even worse if you want to promote multiple things and only get a single bio link to use. If you're like me and want to promote multiple things and only have one link to work with, you'll probably end up using some kind of link aggregator site like Linktree or Beacons or a card website or something. But then that's just adding one more click minimum, one more task people have to go through to get to whatever they're interested in, and in turn means that out of everyone who sees what you're promoting and is interested in it, only a small fraction of those people will actually be able to find what you're promoting. It sucks. I am so done with social media that doesn't let you use hyperlinks. Instagram and TikTok are basically dead to me at this point. I still use TikTok sometimes because I have a pretty decent audience over there. And Instagram has the ability to let me tag products from my shop directly in photos, which makes it useful for shop promotions at least. But for the most part, I have completely stopped using both of them. Twitter and some other places will let you use hyperlinks in post, but there's some debate over whether or not a hyperlink will make it so the post doesn't get as many views. In my experience, eh, it's hard to say for certain. But on YouTube, if I make a video and promote a thing in the video, not only can I add a direct hyperlink in the description of the video, I also have the option to have the link pop up in the video itself at the exact time I mention it. And I can also just post all of the links to all of my products under every video I make. It's simple, it's easy, and it makes things extremely accessible, which, as I just explained, is pretty dang important for self-promotion purposes. Oh, but while we're here, to air a slight grievance, hey, YouTube, hi, hey, it's me again. Listen, I love you and all, but hey, I'm very grumpy that you removed being able to post hyperlinks on shorts, extremely grumpy about it, actually. I understand if it's for like 
keeping people from posting spam links or whatever, but at least let creators post hyperlinks in the comments of their own videos. Please, pretty please, I am on my hands and knees begging for my links back. I want them back, please and thank you. <clears throat> okay, moving on. I had been on the TikTok grind for a few years when I started using YouTube. At the time, my online store provided most of my monthly income, and I was bringing in most of my customers through social media marketing. I was spending hours every week hunting for trends I could use and rework for my own purposes, spending more hours filming TikToks in large batches, editing them all, and setting alarms to remind myself to post them during opportune timeframes. I had managed to build a decent audience there, but overall I really felt like I was spinning my wheels and going nowhere most of the time. I would occasionally make a video about my shop products that would perform well and I'd get a few new sales, but nothing that lasted longer than a day or two. I'd make videos promoting my webcomic as well, but those didn't do much to attract new readers. I would occasionally look at the analytics for Castoff's website, and while there was a slight increase in my view counts over the years, the graph was still frustratingly flat. I had plateaued, and no matter how much work I put into the TikTok marketing, it still felt like I was barely making any progress. The brief flashes of success kept me using the platform, kept me posting new videos constantly and praying for a big hit, but there was no consistency whatsoever. Doing this kind of job really is a feast or famine lifestyle. And while I had some weeks where social posts would perform well and I'd make more sales than usual, there were some months I'd only make it to half of my ideal sales quota. And then the self-doubt and desperation would start to kick in and I'd force myself to spend more hours on TikTok, more hours making videos that might drive a few sales that might make me a bit of money, and oftentimes I didn't get much, if any, results. Press the button over and over and over again and still starve. Another problem with most social media these days is the lifespan of the posts you make. On platforms like Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, usually your posts will only be circulated on the first day or even just the first few hours after you make them. After that, platforms will generally stop pushing those posts out to people and they won't be seen hardly at all. Which means that if you want to be visible on those platforms, you need to be posting very frequently, which becomes less viable if you're an artist who can't be constantly churning out immaculate finished pieces. With all of these factors combined, I eventually started to feel the exhaustion from the grind. I had been going so hard at my social media presence, trying to market my store, my webcomic, any of my work so I could earn a little income and pay my rent, but I was still stuck on that plateau. Lodged in place, wheels spinning, but ultimately not making any meaningful progress. Which is around the time I started using YouTube. Like I said, I'd had this channel for a little while before I really started using it. A few years before, I had gotten very lucky with my How to Web comic Twitch VODs going semi-viral and getting over 100,000 views, which pushed me up over the 1,000 subscriber mark and let me start monetizing my channel. At the time, I wasn't really making much, only about $50 a month or less. Not much in the grand scheme of things, but it was some nice passive pocket change, if nothing else. Then, around early 2022, I had been self-employed for almost three years and was growing very disillusioned with the social media self-promotion grind. Burnt out and struggling after my cost of living doubled when I was forced out of my apartment and into a house, I started looking for alternative ways I could add to my monthly income. During my time as an artist, I had gotten extremely used to watching YouTube videos while drawing. When working on art or comic pages, I almost always had some sort of videos playing in the background to help keep me focused. And at some point, I got very into watching art channels. I enjoyed listening to other artists talk about their craft, but even more so, I loved watching art commentary and art story time videos. Artists would take time lapses of art they drew, speed it up, and play it as B-roll footage in the background while they talked about a topic or told a story. It was a simple formula, but it worked well and didn't require a lot of extensive editing. And eventually, I started thinking, hey, I could do that. My channel was already monetized, and so, in theory, if I made more videos and got more views, I could maybe start pulling in a little more money from the platform. In addition, I could use time lapses for my webcomic or shop merchandise for the videos and use that as an opportunity to promote them. And I'd have an outlet for all the bizarre and interesting life stories I often told during my Twitch live streams, as well as something fun to work on that wasn't necessarily art-related. Four birds, one stone. 
Eventually, I got in the habit of hitting record every time I sat down to draw, and before too long, I had a pretty hefty backlog of art footage I could use as B-roll. It took a few months for me to hype myself up, but I eventually finally scripted out and recorded my first art and storytime video, talking about a weird art commission experience from college. At first, I wanted to aim for just one video a month, but because the videos were fairly simple to make, I eventually started doing them once every two weeks, and that became my schedule moving forward. The nice thing about my videos is that they are, by definition, fairly low effort. I said this on a live stream recently and people got me at me, but I still say it's true. Because I draw so much for work, all I have to do is hit record and I have an endless cache of art footage to use in my videos. After that, all I have to do is script and record the voiceover and edit it all together. The scripting is what takes the longest, but even then, scripts for storytime videos generally only take a few hours, maybe a few days to put together. And here's the thing. If my videos weren't low effort, I likely wouldn't have time for them at all. I'm already juggling so many other things that if I had to spend more time on my videos, they probably wouldn't ever get finished. So while there's some things I'd like to start doing for my videos in the future, what I have now works pretty well within my schedule. Anyway, once I started posting videos regularly, it was slow going for the first few months. On average, my videos got maybe a few hundred views, but I steadily started gaining more subscribers over time. I'd make a video, tell a fun little story, and use footage of a time lapse of whatever new illustration or merch piece I had recently finished. I made a point to drop in a little self-promotion in every video as though I was sponsoring myself. Heck, I even did it at the start of this video, if you remember. I'd take about 30 seconds to talk about the art I was drawing and promoting where to get it or what it was about. With my nice and convenient little hyperlinks in the description, of course. By December, about five months after I started, I was hitting close to 500 views per video on average and had gotten around 1,000 new subscribers since starting, which was exciting. The progress was slow, but I was still making pretty good traction by promoting my YouTube on my other, more established social platforms. And then around the middle of December, that very first art commission story video got picked up by the algorithm randomly, months after I had uploaded it. I don't know how it happened or why, I just remember being in the artist alley at Holiday Matsuri and excitedly checking my phone between customers, watching the view count soar into the five digits and my subscriber count suddenly rising to 4,000, 5,000, and even hitting 6,000 subscribers by the end of the year. I remember excitedly talking to my grandparents about my channel when they came and stayed with me for New Year's and even showed them my next video before it was released to the public. Then, a few days later, I dropped my first video of 2023 my weirdest injury stories. And I guess I managed to get the clickbait thumbnail just right because that video hit over 2,000 views in the first day after being published, which was extremely exciting. And then by the end of the week, it had hit over 100,000 views, rising again to over 300,000 by the end of the second week. My subscriber numbers jumped, gaining hundreds of new subs every day for several days as the video rose in views. And the rest of my videos started racking up new views as well. Folks were watching my injury stories video and seeking out my other stories afterwards. I didn't have too many released at that point, but folks were watching them anyway, leaving comments saying they had just found my channel and were excited to see my future works. But what was most exciting for me was so remember how I do short promo segments at the beginning of each video? Well, the art in the Injury Stories video was art for Castoff's Monthly Mail Club. I spent a little time talking about the webcomic and where you could read it with a link to the comic's website in the description. And as the Injury Story started making the rounds, I started to notice an influx of new comments on the webcomic site as well. New readers checking out the archive, reading all 700-ish pages of the comic and expressing their excitement as they reached the end of the archive posting theories for upcoming pages and asking for when the next page would be posted. And when I went back and checked Castoff's website analytics, I was shocked to find a massive spike in views, higher than anything I'd ever seen on the website in all seven and a half years I'd been posting the series at that point. And in that moment, I felt myself gain footing again. All those months, years even, that I had spent spinning my wheels and going nowhere Finally, I was seeing movement. Finally, I wasn't locked in place, stuck at that dreaded plateau. 
it was only a slight reprieve. Once the video started cooling off after a few weeks, things settled a bit. But they never settled as low as they had before the jump. When you look at Kassoff's view counts, you'll see them holding pretty steady up until January of 2023, when the Injury Stories video was released. A massive spike of new readers from when the video went viral, and then settling down a few weeks later at double what the average was before. And they would stay in that range until later on in spring, when I had two more videos go viral in a row. And since I promoted my comic in those videos too, there was another spike in my website's view counts only to settle back to an average daily view count that was close to triple what it had been at the end of 2022. Not all of my videos performed amazingly. Hell, these days I'm lucky to have a video hit over 20,000 views in the first week. But even my videos that don't perform amazingly help drive views to not just my comic, but also to my store and my Patreon. I barely have to market my shop anymore because folks are finding it through my YouTube channel, and my Patreon earnings have more than doubled since the start of the year. I'd be willing to wager that 90% of the new patrons I got this year came from finding me on YouTube, reading my comic, enjoying it, and then deciding to join the Patreon, all because I showed art I was making for the comic in a YouTube video. I was asked pretty early on if I'd ever want to be a full-time YouTuber, and my answer back then was the same as it is now. While it would be nice if my videos could bring in a bit of extra money, I've always wanted my main focus to be on my comic work. But looking back now, after what the last year has been like, if I had known how good YouTube would be for my career as an artist, I would have started years ago, to the point where I look back and want to kick myself for spending so much time trying to suck up to TikTok for a scrap of attention when YouTube gave it out in spades. YouTube videos take longer to make than TikToks, sure, and more effort has to go into them because of that. But YouTube videos like the ones I make are what's called evergreen content. It isn't trying to ride a specific fad or trend that will only be popular for a few weeks at most. Rather, the videos get new views all the time. They're continually recommended to new people, and even though the bulk of the views comes from the first week or so after posting, I still get comments on old videos from people who just found them recently, which is something you'd almost never see on other platforms. Longer videos means they appeal to folks like myself, people who watch videos in the background while working on doing other things. And being able to post hyperlinks in the description means it's infinitely easier to promote other things with your videos rather than having to court people into doing the link in bio song and dance. And one of the most important things that I haven't even mentioned yet is that YouTube actually pays me. I was in the TikTok creator fund for almost my entire time on the platform, and I remember that every time I had a video go viral, I'd only get, what, $5, maybe 10 for a video with hundreds of thousands of views. Meanwhile, I could make a YouTube video that only hit 50,000 views and make a couple hundred bucks from it. I'm definitely not in a place where YouTube could be a full-time job for me, but in my case, it doesn't need to be. That isn't my goal. The money I earn from this channel ends up getting invested back into the channel, as well as being put towards other projects. Another important thing to remember if you want to be self-employed is that you have to have multiple pillars of income. That way, your earnings are more stable and you don't have to rely on only one source too heavily. I earn a bit from YouTube, but I also earn money from my webcomic, my Patreon, my online store, and doing conventions. And that puts a lot less stress on me trying to make every single YouTube video perform well. I don't need every video to be a viral success to keep food on the table. I can go with the flow, make videos I want to make, and let YouTube function mostly as a hobby with a lot of good marketing reach. YouTube for me is part of my... <laughs> I call it my content ecosystem, which is the worst and most bullshit influencery sounding name for a thing, but it works pretty well and I haven't come up with anything better. Don't look at me like that. The idea is that my YouTube videos and my other projects have a symbiotic relationship with each other. When I make a new illustration for my comic or new merch for my store, I record the art process and use that footage for my YouTube videos. The YouTube videos, in return, make people interested in my comic and merch, which then helps lead to getting new readers from the comic or new sales on the store, which then, in turn, benefits me, you know, staying alive and keeping my kitties fed. 
So if you're also an artist or creator and you're trying to decide if YouTube is a good choice for you, I'd say go for it. If you like my videos and want to try to make your own, go for it. Just just do it. Try it out and see if you like it. Steal my format. This is me giving you permission to do so. I don't care. I was not the first person to make these types of videos and I will certainly not be the last. I've seen a few other folks starting to make their own videos who tag me and credit me as their inspiration. And every time I see it, I just say to myself, heck yeah, make that bank, let's go. <laughs> My suggestion though, if you're starting a channel is to do it casually at first. Don't worry too much about begetting big and famous. Don't treat it like the one thing you have to do to make it as an artist. Just focus on making videos that you like and want people to see. It'll take a lot of the stress off of you and make it a lot more of an enjoyable process. And if you decide you want to make YouTube videos, well, here's some advice I have based on my own experience. Some of these are pretty general, but others are more specifically for art-related channels. Depending on the type of videos you want to make, your mileage with these tips may vary. So here are my YouTube tips. Your video's thumbnail and title should work together, and the information they give shouldn't overlap too much. The thumbnail is basically going to be the first thing people see, followed by the title. Half the time when I'm scrolling through my recommended videos, I don't even look at titles. If a thumbnail grabs me, then I look at what the title says. In my experience, the best thumbnails entice potential viewers to ask questions. Then the title elaborates on the thumbnail and your video should answer whatever question they're going to be asking. In my case, the question most people ask when looking at my thumbnails is, what the heck happened? <laughs> I take a moment from the video I think is the most interesting or shocking, use that for the thumbnail, and give a bit more context in the title without giving too much away. Also, I know we all hate clickbaity thumbnails, but unfortunately they do work. Too much clickbait can be a turnoff, but not having your thumbnails be enticing enough means you're more likely to just completely get overlooked. Here are the thumbnails and titles from some of my most successful videos. Do with these what you will. As for the actual video, for the most effective marketing and self-promotion, I structure my story times like so. A short intro that hints at the climax but leaves people craving context to get them hooked. Then I do my short self-promo slash faux sponsor segment at the start, and then on with the rest of the video. I also usually drop the self-promotion again during the end credits as an additional reminder. I find that doing it this way gives the best results. If the self-promo is the first thing at the start of the video, people will get bored and click away. And if you're only doing it at the end, people won't pay as much attention to it or click on another video before you're finished saying it. I give them a good hook, sprinkle in the promo while I have their attention, give them what they came for, and then bookend the video with another short promo as a reminder now that the video is finished and they're about to leave. Another tip I have for video production is to make sure you have good audio. If you're going to invest in anything before starting your channel, invest in a halfway decent microphone. It's much easier to forgive bad looking video than it is to look past bad audio. Take some time to research beginner microphones and how to record and edit your audio to sound decent. You don't need to jump straight into a big fancy audio rig right away. A decent USB mic is perfectly fine to get you started, and there are some pretty solid ones out there you can get for $100 or less. I'm far from an audio expert, so I can't give too much specific advice here, but doing a little independent research will really benefit you in the long run. Additionally, I highly recommend that you script your videos. I personally tried doing some videos with just an outline and improvising when I first started, but I ended up having to edit the audio pretty heavily and still didn't like the end results. Scripting your videos in advance will help keep you on topic, help you avoid using too many filler words, and overall make for a nicer experience. I also recommend editing out any weird mouth sounds, filler words, long pauses, etc. Try to keep it snappy and engaging. Also, try not to sound too robotic or monotone while you record. Rather than just reading the words off this page, pretend like you're telling a story to your best friend. Embrace your inner theater kid and put some personality into it. It'll make for a much more engaging final product if you really let yourself have fun with it. Taking a hint from TikTok, YouTube has recently been pushing shorts on the platform. Vertical videos under a minute long that get their own section on your channel page and on the recommended videos. 
The format is basically just copying TikTok, so if you're already familiar with TikTok, you might as well do shorts too, right? I use shorts for a few purposes. I make mini time-lapse videos as well as short story times and mini tutorials. For my short time-lapses, I know it's easy and tempting to just upload a time-lapse video of a drawing with some nice music playing under it and call it a day, but in my experience, those aren't the most interesting videos to watch and people will usually just scroll past them. I've had good luck adding a little bit of narration to my tiny time-lapse videos, saying what I'm drawing and spending about 30 to 45 seconds talking about the art, the character I'm drawing, any techniques I used, anything interesting I have to say about the art, etc. I'll leave the link to my playlist in the description for folks who want to see some examples of what I'm talking about. Additionally, one other reason shorts are beneficial is that every single social media platform is trying to be TikTok right now. So you might as well use that to your advantage, right? I focus on making vertical videos specifically for YouTube, but I also cross post the same videos on TikTok, Instagram Reels, Pinterest, and any other platform I can. We in the industry call that recycling. And lastly, totally random tip, but if you wanna promote a video on your community tab, don't use the share video function. I don't know if this is a universal thing, but every time I've used that feature, my posts do absolutely terribly. Post the video's thumbnail or something with a hyperlink in the first few lines of the text portion instead. I don't know why the engagement completely tanks when you share a video directly, but it very clearly has in every instance that I've used it, so be mindful of that. YouTube as a platform has its fair share of problems, between annoying and unpredictable ad restrictions to its lack of good tools for live streaming and everything in between, it's far from a perfect platform. But I can't deny that starting this channel has been a huge boon for me in my artistic career. When I finally hit 100K, I kept having viewers in my stream chat saying, aim for 1 million, you're gonna hit a million someday. And while I think that thought is nice, I'm, honestly pretty happy with what I've achieved so far. I'm not the fastest growing YouTuber nor the best at what I do, but I like to think I've made some fun videos that people enjoy. And most importantly, it's helped me find a huge new audience of people who enjoy my work, whether it's videos, comics, streams, or anything else. So thank you all so much for helping me get this far, and I hope you'll stick around for whatever else comes next. And so ends my tangled mess of thoughts. Happy 100,000 subscribers, everybody. <laughs> Let's go. This video is coming out a little later than usual. I'm experimenting a bit with my schedule to try and take some of the pressure off. I'm gonna be toying around with the more freeform schedule for a bit to see how I like it, but my Patreon supporters and channel members will continue to get videos early, so keep your eyes open for the next one. Once again, the art in this video is from my webcomic Castoff's November Mail Club. You can get this month's goodies by joining my Patreon before the month is over, and if you want to get to know the characters, you can read the entire comic for free at castoff-comic.com. Links for all of those are in the description. All right, that's all for me. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye!